Depending on the news story, pharmaceutical companies are either saviors of the world or some of the most evil organizations that have ever existed. Unfortunately, the truth is more complicated. In this video, we're going to explore how the pharmaceutical industry can bring together some of the brightest minds to create life-saving medications while at the same time being deceptive and greedy. We're gonna do this with the story of Prozac. But first, we need to talk about Benadryl. Benadryl was first discovered by researchers at the University of Cincinnati in 1943. And by the 1960s, researchers started to see that Benadryl had a slight antidepressant effect. They saw that it caused an increase in the level of serotonin in our bodies. Because researchers were looking for a way to treat depression, and they knew serotonin affected depression, they decided to look at how Benadryl could be used to treat depression. Two guys named Brian Malloy and Robert Rathbun went to work. Using Benadryl as their basis, they created several derivatives. Each of these derivatives had different effects on serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. Because they thought that serotonin had the most profound effect on mood, they looked for the derivative that isolated the effect on serotonin the most. In 1972, there was a scientist named David Wong who worked for Eli Lilly, and he found a chemical that he called fluoxetine that had the most profound and isolated effect on serotonin. This worked by inhibiting the reuptake of serotonin. Basically what this means is that when your body produces a chemical, it will reuptake it to get it out of the system. If you keep the production the same and you decrease the reuptake, the result is an increased overall level of that chemical. And his findings showed that fluoxetine affected the serotonin level the most. He published these results in 1974. And in 1975, it got the official name fluoxetine and Eli Lilly coined the brand name Prozac. In 1977, it was cleared for human trials. And in 1986, it hit the market in Belgium. And by 1987, it had gained approval by the FDA and hit the market in the United States. Within one year, the annual sales of Prozac eclipsed $350 million. Worldwide sales eventually peaked at $2.6 billion per year. But when it comes to pharmaceuticals, their patent only lasts for 20 years in the United States. And this is where the controversy starts. To understand the controversy of Prozac, we need to understand the concept of a product line extension. Whenever a pharmaceutical company has a patent, they're the only ones that are allowed to make that medication. And whenever their patent is set to expire, they try to find ways to extend it. And legally, they can do this through a product line extension. There are two primary ways in which pharmaceutical companies do a product line extension. The first one is by changing the formulation and the second is by changing the indication of the medication. If a pharmaceutical company can do this, they can then extend the patent on their medications and continue to be the sole maker of that medication. Otherwise, the medication becomes generic, and this means that anyone can make it, which decreases the profits for the pharmaceutical companies, but also decreases the cost to the consumer. This is why generic medications tend to be significantly cheaper. There was a guy named Richard Wartman who was working at MIT, and he found that Prozac could be used to treat the controversial diagnosis of premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Now, PMDD is controversial, because it makes the argument that typical PMS symptoms should be considered a psychiatric disorder. And if they're considered a psychiatric disorder, that means that you can get a patent extension for your medication. Because Eli Lilly realized that Prozac was nearing the end of its patent, they were looking for that product line extension. So they purchased the patent that Richard Wardman had filed for Prozac to treat PMDD. They then funded a ton of clinical studies and rebranded Prozac as Seraphim to treat PMDD. Eli Lilly was criticized for this for multiple reasons. First, they allegedly paid for PMDD to be considered an actual diagnosis in the DSM-4. The DSM-4 at the time was considered the standard for diagnoses of psychiatric conditions and therefore should be impartial to pharmaceutical companies. The argument that people had against it being considered a diagnosis was that PMDD was truly just a normal symptom and not necessarily a psychiatric disease. 
And the second thing they were criticized for were the commercials. It's back, the week before your period. Mood swings, bloating, irritability. Think it's PMS? Did you take my keys? Maybe it's PMDD. Those complaints were valid. So what was the result of all of this? Prozac ended up going generic in August of 2001. And within two months, their sales fell by 70%. Seraphim sales, on the other hand, reached $85 million per year by 2002. And Eli Lilly ended up selling it to a company called Galen Holdings for $295 million later that year. In 2004, European regulators ruled that paraffin and Prozac could not be labeled for PMDD because it wasn't an actual diagnosis. As for fluoxetine, it continues to be popular. In 2020, there were over 23 million prescriptions filled in the United States for fluoxetine. The general consensus on fluoxetine is that it's effective for depression, OCD, and panic attacks, but is best when used alongside cognitive behavioral therapy. By looking at the history of Prozac, we get to see the ingenuity and determination that it takes to make new medications. However, at the same time, we get to see the dark side of the pharmaceutical industry, where they distort reality and create diagnoses in order to sell more of their medications. And by understanding how Prozac went through this process, we can understand how the pharmaceutical industry works at large. Thanks for stopping by to watch my video. If you enjoyed it, consider subscribing and check out my previous video on the history of Tylenol.